causing Crusoe to eat more. So there's going to be some uh, some some extra eating, but uh, there's also going to be some, a pull this way. So you got a pull. It's kind of a, what uh, Garrison calls a tug of war along this thing that pulls you out toward this dive. And because the money is injected into the banks, the Austrians tell the story that uh, this side of the tug of war wins over this side. And we go out a little bit. Now, another thing I should mention about this is that um, anywhere along the production possibility curve, we have full employment. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have less than uh, less than the natural rate of unemployment. We're going to have a you know, very hot economy. It looks like everything's great, kind of like a 2004. We got a 3% unemployment rate in the United States. And uh, building lots of houses, and all the rules have changed. And then it deteriorates. And we end up in here. And it's the boom and the bust. So the bust is, you know, we, we don't end, Crusoe doesn't end up, neither does the mon mon monetized economy or Crusoe end up back at a point on the production possibility curve. They end up worse off. Crusoe's going to end up worse off for having burned up all those calories and wasted all that effort to sow seeds that were not real seeds. Crusoe was chasing a phantom, and so are businessmen. Businessmen are chasing a future, a big future, a future in which people have saved up for lots of stuff. But that's not the future that's going to happen, because households are saving for this future. Households are saving for a little future. The wedge between the future that businesses plan for out here and the future that households have saved for guarantees you that you it's going to be a house that you're going to have a, a bust, and that's uh, that's the Austrian theory. Now, if you listen to this. Uh, boom and bust rap video at this point after having listened to me talk about this then I go you know you might you might look at that 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 really has a lot of elements in here that I'm talking about today that'll reinforce some of what, what we just talked about uh, you know what I'm talking about everybody know what I'm talking yeah. about that yeah. boom and bust rap video and uh, take a look at that and uh, that's your assignment There'll be a quiz at the next uh, econ club meeting. And, uh, bring your clickers. Okay. So that, that's it. I'm done. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. So after a while, wouldn't businesses start to realize that that interest rate is artificially set, and maybe try to offset that? Yeah, but they're eventually they'd be kind of picking at random, wouldn't they? Trying to decide what. Well, th th this, this is the question people ask a lot of times, and then I, I my, my answer is well, the different businessmen. You know, it's, well, wouldn't voters learn if they live forever? Well, yeah, they see infinitely smart, but the, but you have always new entrepreneurs, and these new on, I've got a stepson who's an entrepreneur. Okay, so do I think that he's learned anything about this? No, he's only been in business for three years. But you're right. It, it, you know, there there will be uh, a sorting out, and uh, probably that's why older guys tend to be CEOs. And they may have a little bit better uh, better ability to read the future. But uh, the, the the precision with which you can read these things, um, and then and then the other temptation is. The other temptation is businessmen are greedy, just like I am. And the other temptation is that you see something going up. As long as you get out before the collapse, you're you're good, right? Yeah. So in, in uh, I've I've gotten screwed up by this too. I you know the stock market was going up like crazy there for a while, and uh, I stayed in a little too. Uh, you know, I mean, I knew it was kind of, but I thought, well, it just, it just goes on like this for another six months, then I'll get out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to work another five years. 
I'm like, yeah, we know enough philosophers, but, <laughs> but uh, another reason they might be skeptical about this is because it's so easy for people to lie with uh, statistics. The and so you know, if if um, you could spend your life uh, just uh, spinning your wheels, uh, ch chasing down all the lies that people are telling, you know, so. The Austrians just, uh, some of them are just going to sensibly say, well, that's, that's crap, go away. And I, I got some empathy for that. Um, I'm, I'm also an economist that would say, well, you know, it's nice to, to see these things play out. But I think, um, I think economic history is every bit as important as uh, mathematical economics or econometrics. So you've got to be a student of history and the, the, these, these things playing out. You say, okay, let's see. After the Great Depression, and it happened here, and it, it keeps happening. You can see these historical episodes of this thing, consistent with this thing. And now it really got a problem. Because if you're going to compare you're going to try to do statistical tests uh, with data from 1929 and 2000, and you're going to try to compare those booms and those busts. Now you really got a problem because the availability of data is different. The uh, you know, all kinds of definitions are. You really got a, a problem to uh, if you want to appease the. Journal editors that would, and that's what it's about too, is that uh, to, to do that. Think about what you're up against as an Austrian. If you're an Austrian, you're up against a whole bunch of uh, journal editors that uh, that basically think this is a bunch of junk. And how do I? Why do I say that? Because the the standard textbook doesn't have this. Now I've come to. A, a conclusion in my mind that the stuff in the standard textbook is junk and this stuff is valuable. But uh, I feel a little bit like, and I, I imagine Austrians feel that way too, like Job in the wilderness. You know, like uh, John the Baptist, that's what I think. The guy is out there yelling about the right things, but he's yelling in the wilderness and people are just saying, hey, forget about that guy. He's nuts. Right? Yeah, that's, that's what being an Austrian has been. Now, Austrians are coming around a little bit. I think, I think that uh, the internet's doing wonders for the Austrians because they're able to make their argument and, and maybe that's a, a bit, another bit of evidence is you see that these arguments on the internet between the Austrians and the, uh, the the other the Krugmans of the world and so forth, these guys are fighting with each other on the internet. And you just go read some of those discussions, and you say, "Wow, the Austrians are." If you if you think about it, you, the Austrians are winning the argument. So I'm kind of, uh, and then you see these things like the uh, the rap video, the, the videos coming out. That uh, you see this resurgence of Austrian thought coming. I'm encouraged by it, but they're still not uh, mainstream, I don't think. It's tough. It's tough to be up against the, uh, the, the, the conventional thought. This is, there's a whole book written by a, a, a scientist named Thomas Kuhn about paradigm shifts. And uh, what happens in science is you get in many cases, you get uh, uh, an establishment, established science, and they have their ideas and their way of thinking about the world, and they don't want to change. Because as long as things stay the way they are, they continue to be the ones that people ask advice for and pay money to. But you come into something with a new idea, you're going to face resistance. And... Uh, you come up against the orthodoxy. And the Austrians are up against the orthodoxy. And I think they're going to have some success breaking through it, but it's... 
and then often orthodoxy collapses and a new paradigm emerges. So the history of science is one of a uh, rapid emergence of a replacing paradigm, replacing an orthodoxy. That's the history of science. Because the guys in there, they're going to want to maintain their status and their power, and they're going to want to maintain the orthodoxy as it is. They're not going to want to listen to you. And uh, that's, that's happening. I'm trying to figure out a way to formulate this question, but I, I want to kind of relate this model to now. And I believe it is uh, Irving Fisher who had the three, uh, three like he made a model that there's three group, age group of people, like in the one is savers, the next are like in the others, assume like they want to stand in the future. I'm trying to, you, you, you remember that exact? Uh, I don't, but. Uh, it might not be Irving Fisher, but. Uh, it sounds like permanent. Permanent income, yeah, the permanent income I talked about. And so I, I wanted to kind of relate that uh, kind of this model to the permanent hypothesis uh, model. And does that basically verify the hypothesis by saying that now the old, all the older older, older uh, generation is basically spending now because they saved earlier? And that and that could kind of relate to that now? Well, here's the, here's the, the thing that that I think about when I think about that idea that the old people are going to try to spend themselves out. Right? The, the idea you have in the back of your mind is that, I think, is that uh, when you get old, your goal is to exhaust your fund before you die. That's sort of what's, in, that's sort of what's implied by what you said. I don't know if that, that's what you think. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a confirmation about us. But, and this is appealing to college students because they don't have children. <laughs> now then, I have a daughter. I think really differently about the future. And I want to, you know, uh, my mother-in-law just died. Nobody knew that she had millions of dollars. Why did she do that? For, well, because she was worried about a kid was worried that they would, she wanted to provide for them something that they'd be safe after she was gone. So this idea that the, that the old people are just going to spend and go out in a flash of consumption. <laughs> There's this model where the, uh, the, the, the best solution to this one economic model, this is how crazy some models are, is that you, you save up until the moment that you you're about to die, and then you go out in a flash of consumption. Economists come up with all kinds of silliness. <laughs> but but you, you know, the real, in the real world, we have a bequest mode. In the real world, we are social animals. In the real world, we care about our children and their future. So this, this business about the old people, aren't they going to just consume a whole lot more and not save very much? I don't know about that. Some, some, but um, I, uh, I don't think it's uniform. I don't think we can talk about old people as um, you know a, a, a reliable thing without variance. There, is some old people, and, and and then there's this thing I'm injecting, which is this bequest mode. It kind of throws a monkey wrench into that whole story. Simple stories uh, that over aggregate are. Are, are you got to be careful with it, over aggregation. This is another thing that Austrians always are going to are going to warn you about. Uh, is this uh, this aggregation, this over aggregated model? Oh yeah. Okay, so y equals c plus i plus g. Those are our aggregates. And so if uh, investment falls, all we have to do is push government expenditure up, and we're back in business, baby. This is Keynesian theory. Right? Uh, this is the fiscal policy uh, solution that I learned about when I was in college in 1976. Uh, learning about the Keynesian multipliers. Yeah, these over aggregated simplistic models, they're just, they're just nonsense. And, and I just assumed. 
decided I wasn't going to teach that stuff anymore. And I wasn't going to teach the models that were based on it anymore, except to parody them. <laughs> That's what I decided. I'm not going to teach that stuff. I'm going to make fun of it. I'm going to be part of the solution. That's what I think I'm doing. And that's what I should do. I mean, it's, it's my job to try to forward knowledge as best, you know, to the best of my understanding. And, and of course, I could be wrong, too. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe the Austrians are all full. But that's not, that's not what's occurring to me. That's not what's emerged in my mind. So I'm here to represent this way. I'm having fun making fun of the other way of doing <laughs> I am. And not everybody over there likes me either because of it. And I've had arguments with some of those guys. And that's okay. You know, we now we talk about the weather. We don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. We don't talk about this anymore. Because it's a waste of my time. And it's a waste of their time. I mean if if you can't, if you can't have an honest discussion about these ideas, if you can't honestly argue them out, then you might as well just talk about the weather. Sports. Hey, how about those colts? <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you. You've been a marvelous audience.